Um, we talked about establishing a purpose for our life. Because if we don't, we will have a posture about life. Semantically, I'm sure you can feel the difference. A purpose would be based on love. Not only love of people, but love of an activity or a company or a concept or an idea or in the environment. Uh, the willingness to prepare. We made comment that the will to win doesn't mean much unless you're willing to prepare. Um, a lot of motivators call it paying the price, paying the price. Um, I don't see it quite that way. Uh, but anyway, you're preparing to make a contribution, a contribution as opposed to being competitive. Um, our experience is that in a social secular environment, uh, the contributor oftentimes will go much, much further than the person who's highly competitive. It's not what we've been taught. But the evidence is in, and it's clear to me that the contributive people will be the one that others will surround around and elevate for their own best interest. And I think that's terribly important to realize. <clears throat> if you don't have a purpose for your life, you'll have a posture about it based on fear, neglect, and a need to survive all the time, always keeping up. When we define a purpose, we talked at length about how it identified the parameters of our life, established pr the, the uh, principles for our life, and that they would be ours, and they'd be in concert with all the principles that are worthwhile in our history. And then, of course, we had to make plans. Uh, plans in four factors of our life. One, the spiritual-emotional. Uh, we all have a connection there somewhere that needs to be addressed. From the very beginning of time, man thought, wow, where, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What's this about? Uh, that's a spiritual facet, and it has to be satisfied. Uh, and then, of course, our emotional balance between love and fear has to be tempered. And how and learn how those interrelate and can satisfy one another is terribly important. Uh, one of the plans would be uh, for our social secular life. Are we going to be married or single? Where are we going to live? How, you know, what are we going to do? What clubs will we join? Who do we want to have for dinner? This type of thing. And then, of course, the physical tangible. That's how are we going to take care of ourselves, how are we going to eat, how are we going to play, how are we going to exercise, uh, how are we, um, uh, and what are we going to acquire? Home and car and clothes and travel and stability of some kind. And then we have a plan for our job, uh, in, uh, what, how are we going to pay for all this? And so there are four plans, and we said that as you define those plans, and narrow them down, they will coincide. They will eliminate, certainly reduce, this tendency of always being where you don't want to be. Uh, I think three or four weeks ago we talked about what a shame it is when you're home, you want to be at work. And when you're at work, you'd rather be at home. Well, if you have a purpose, you'll find a way where you can satisfy yourself wherever you happen to be uh, because of this interrelating that goes on. And then, of course, projects. Projects are short-term things that are manageable. Um, on another essay, we talk about making commitments that are obviously uh, completable. I mean, and completions create energy, and they can move you on through these things. There's no surprises. If you do these things, you know what's going to occur. And if you don't do these things, you know what to expect. It's going to happen that way. Um, after all of this, we have to almost fall in love with and embrace the concept of practicing. I think it's good to take a little bit of time about this. You realize that uh, the professional people, doctors and lawyers, don't succeed or fail. The, the language does not apply to them. You never hear about a doctor succeeding or failing. A doctor practices or he doesn't practice. A lawyer practices or he doesn't practice. That makes sense? You've, you've heard the phrase. Uh, we have the right to take that same attitude. We're just practicing. Okay? In doing that, when we get into this concept of practicing, there are some issues here. One, you automatically have a permission. Two, there's a premise that means you have to stretch and a promise that you're going to get better. But let's go back. Permission for what? <laughs> to be clumsy, inept, inadequate. And if it's a verbal, social thing, occasionally inappropriate. Uh, as you reach out, exercising your pet capacities in order to develop some skills uh, or some abilities, which in turn, honed and practice will lead to skills, okay, in that, in that format. Uh, a permission to be clumsy and inept. Terribly important, because otherwise, if you tend to be a perfectionist, you may not participate well. 
Uh, I know when I'm interviewing someone uh, to work with as an entrepreneur or salesperson or whatever, uh, that's one of the questions that will come up. Uh, what do you often criticize for? And uh, I'll tell you, as often as not, I hear, well, I'm a perfectionist. And I, right away, I know we got a problem. Because here's a person maybe who needs to know how to do it perfectly well before he'll do it. He's kind of in concert with this idea, we call it a court ui uh, that if something is worth doing, it's worth doing well. We all know it, don't we? Bad counsel. If something is worth doing, it's worth starting badly. Because as you practice it, commit yourself to it, okay, get it on purpose, that you will get better. There's no way you cannot. There's nothing you do today that you didn't start badly. Eating, dressing, tying your shoes, you know what I mean? Driving a car, riding a bike, it was all the same. Every new issue was terribly difficult. However, it doesn't take long because our mind has a marvelous way of adapting to any adjustments that we make, providing we commit ourselves to practicing. Just practice. Uh, the premise is you got to stretch. There's no question. You got to call on people that won't respond. You got to go for shots that you can't possibly get. You know what I mean? You just have to do that. I remember when I first came to uh, California some years ago, I had never had a tennis racket in my hand. And I thought, gee, California, I mean, you got to be able to play tennis. I mean, to be socially acceptable, you know? It just seemed that way, you know? And uh, at that time, I was, uh, oh, let's see, in my 60s. And uh, it was some time ago. And I uh, weighed about 200 and I think at the time 78 pounds or so. And I bought a couple of rackets and some balls, and there I was out on the tennis court. And uh, I remember the second day out there, the manager of our apartment that we were staying at the time was kind of watching us through the fence. And she actually I kind of chased a ball over to where she was standing and was picking it up. And she said, what's a big old fat man like you doing playing tennis? <laughs> and I just, yeah, that's called confirmation. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. Applauding the effort. Yeah. That's not uncommon, is it? People will do that to us. Um, I don't even remember what the comment was. Probably, well, it's because it's here and I want to become adept. And uh, I was clumsy. Yeah, it's pretty embarrassing when you're reasonably athletic to swing that big racket. I got one of the big ones, too. To swing that big racket at that little ball and actually miss it, you know? <laughs> or, you know, when you've done some other things fairly well and you hit a tennis ball and it goes over the fence into the other guy's yard, you know? And you know that's not supposed to happen. Oh, and then they tell you you're supposed to go to the net. You ever hear that one? You go to the net. And that's not easy because you know when you do, you're going to get a fuzzball right in the mouth. You know what I mean? They're going to nail you when you're up there. But when you do it, you find, whoa, the game gets easier at the net. Dramatically, your shot broadens. And, oh, and then the other thing is stay way back on the, on the baseline. Not a natural thing to do. It takes practice. And I remember going way over there for a shot and missing it. And I'd scramble over there for a shot and miss it. Oh, and then someone would lob one over my head. Oh, and you try to go backwards to get it, and you fall down and hit your head on that tennis court, and you know, you know you're going to die. Yeah, it's just like a beach whale out there. But I tell you, I got better. Got better and better and better at it. Uh, and I got to the point where I felt I could comfortably play with most people. Now, I wasn't up to Wimbledon, you know, yet. No. no. Anyway, permission, premise. Promises you're going to get better. Never perfect. You got to get past practice makes perfect. That's a lie. And there's a little piece of the mind that knows it's a lie and therefore it excuses you from what? Practicing. Yeah. Now, yeah, you must practice uh, because practice always makes better and you can count on that. Now, when you, now we've, uh, we've done an alliteration here that helps you remember this. Uh, but there's a lot of power here. And that led me to another concept, another concept that we came up on. Um, and I'm going to take this off here. Probably have a single sheet. I'm going to lay this over here just in case you might be able to see it and make reference to it. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's called a peak to peak principle. That's P-E-A-K to P-E-A-K. Peak to peak principle. To progress. All right. Now, years ago, this came frankly out of, uh, I was watching uh, Dr. Robert Shuler. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard of him. 
watching him one Sunday morning, and he had a peak-to-peak -peak principle. And his was P-E-A-K to P-E-E-K. It was clever. I appreciated it. Uh, what he was saying is when you peek out, then you get a peek at what could be later. I mean, the, you know, I, I go for that. And yet there was something else was going on in my mind, and so it, it eventuated into a peak-to-peak -peak principle. Now, what this is about, um, it's we have this time lifeline that we mentioned way back in Life Formula, and we kind of made reference to in the last two or three weeks, a time lifeline that extends between this moment now and that questionable place in the future when we cease to exist. Um, the peak to peak recognizes that here we stand today with a certain stature. Now, whatever environment you're in, your home, your church, your company, your clubs, uh, you are perceived a certain way in that environment. Now, it may not be a common cop topic of discussion, but you know that it's true. Uh, I've worked with a lot of uh, staffs and sales forces and what have you. And after a few days, I have a thing called a peer consciousness survey that we'll go in. And what we'll do is alphabetize the, the members of the staff. And then over here, we'll put the qualities of a great staff person. Enthusiasm, you know, uh, punctuality, grooming, you know what I mean? In other words, synergy, all the qualities that would really make them good. Then we ask people to just draw a line so they can't be identified. Just draw a line from an individual to the qualities that they possess, all right? Uh, knows the, the top enthusiasm and the top guy and punctuality and what have you. And it's incredible. It's incredible. There is a unanimous feeling that comes out of that. Everybody knows who that is, whatever that category, all the way down to who should be excused from the environment. You know, all the way down, and the, the lines will go there. And guess who will draw a line there? The guy who is supposed to be excused from the environment. When we think about it, we know there is a stature thing going on. There's no question. Uh, now, the idea is that all of us, if we understand, oh, strategizing, which is another concept that we talk about, and understand progress, is that what it's really about, really about, is getting down here, having grown from the process, grown spiritually and emotionally, grown financially, as we want to grow. And in keeping with what we were talking about earlier, uh, this has to be based on love. It has to be commitment, okay? And there has to be a willingness to prepare to do that. The willingness to prepare and a contribution has to be made and you have that stature. Now, of course, it's not going to work that way. Because in the scheme of things, if this entity sees it this way, this is called being illusionary. Uh, in other words, there's an illusion of what you want, of what you'd like to have and what have you. But from this position, as you look out, all you can see is blue sky. You ever hear that expression? Blue sky. Yeah. And it's easy to despair when you understand the Sisyphus syndrome. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's going to be over before you start. So I've encountered a lot of young people that say, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 35. And I applaud that. I think, like, wonderful. How are you going to do it? Well, I don't know, but I believe and therefore I will achieve. Well, you better get busy practicing something here, you know, because it's not going to occur otherwise. I mean, people say, you know, that you can have anything you want. No, can't. Can't. You can have anything you're willing to prepare for and contribute toward. So long as it's within the law, you know, cause and effect, equal and opposite reaction, gravity, and the laws of the land. You've got to be within the law as well. So it's not going to work this way. Um, let's take a look at this. We'll do another one here. It's going to be more like this. This is your statue today. This is where you want to be. Um, but the thing is, you're going to have to be able to constantly keep an eye, a vision, if you would, on the end result. You've got to be able to see that clearly. We talked about that in the first essay. We called it crystallizing. You've got to always be able to see what it is you're up to. Therefore, this peak is going to have to go this way. You're going to have to con you know, prepare and contribute, and you will have grown. Now, that might be as little as assuming responsibility for a meeting. Maybe you've never done one. Maybe you're overwhelmed about it, but you say, I'll, I'll, I'll do the meeting. 
and you'll be apprehensive and nervous and a little bit overwhelmed and, and what have you, but you prepare and you do the very best you can and you go and probably a little clumsy and inept, but people will give you accolades. They'll give you accolades and you've grown from the experience because the next meeting is going to be just a little bit easier, a little bit easier. Never perfect, just a little easier, you know, but you've grown because you've acquired some stature from the contribution. It'll be at that peak. Maybe not a lot yet, but it's more. And then so you prepare again and you make a contribution and you prepare, make a contribution, prepare, make a contribution, prepare, make a contribution. See, that is your peak to peak. And you know what's really fascinating is that this preparation and this contribution, when you're there, will be just as easy as this one was and this one became. Does that make sense? It will be. It'll be just as easy. Uh, well, just as challenging, just as nerve-wracking, but just as easily accomplished is what I'm saying. You'll have a comparable experience. Uh, it's not going to work that way, though. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work that way. There's going to have to perhaps be, uh, have to take a look at this one. You hear, and uh, you want to be here. Okay. You have to have your vision. Have to have your vision, so we're going to do this. And, and very similar to the last one, you're going to have to prepare and contribute. And then prepare and contribute. And prepare and contribute. And somewhere along in here, there's going to be some of these. And then perhaps you'll be able to do this one. Now, what these are are maturation points. These are maturation points. And what that means is, <clears throat> say for example, if what this is about is the accomplishment of a certain income. Well, you might be heading in the right track, but you'll find yourself bogging down, getting stagnant. And you'll wonder, why can't I move forward? Well, maybe this has something to do not with the vocational avocational, but with the spiritual emotional. Maybe there's some work to do there in order to prepare yourself to move on. Uh, it, may, it may be about your social secular. For example, there was a young fellow in my life years ago, Jody Talal. We recruited essentially Jody off the street. And uh, he matured and did very well in our company. Uh, and following some of these principles that we're talking about, at 16 prepared a list of things he wanted to accomplish. It included having a luxury car and a uh, sports car, a uh, dirt bike, motorcycle, and a, and a, and a road bike. And uh, he wanted a freshwater yacht that would sleep six for partying on Lake Texoma. And uh, he wanted uh, 30 suits, he wanted 30 different suits with all the equipments that go with the suits. He wanted a trip around the world. That's a pretty ambitious list for a 16-year-old kid. I will tell you, by the time, or before he was 21, he had them all. Had them all. Had sold a couple of them for a profit. Uh, last time I talked to Jody, he had reached, I mean, millions of dollars in income. And some years after that, when we were, I was in Pennsylvania, and he called me, and we were chatting, and he was stuck. I think it was around two, 12 million or something like that. Poor baby. Uh, you know, he just couldn't seem to move on. And I said, you know, there was a discussion. I said, Jody, uh, you know I love you, and that gives me permission to suggest something to you. You're doing well vocationally, professionally, there's no question. But you must know that your social acumen is lacking. He never graduated from high school. You know what I mean? In other words, he, he really didn't introduce people to each other well. Uh, he, he oftentimes was clumsy at the table. You know what I mean? In other words, he didn't use the right fork in the right way, and he, he was confused about that. Uh, in other words, and the word got out, of course, that he didn't have this background. He wasn't aware of art and couldn't talk music, you know. And so there was some developing he had to do. Uh, he also had no spiritual connections. In other words, he was brought up in a Jewish home that was not practicing. And so he had been kind of abandoned in that area. And so he started looking for that. In other words, he, he followed the counsel and began to search out the answers to some of these questions. And indeed did find a a spiritual emotional balance in his life uh, through some experiences that he had and seminars and connections that he made. Uh, he went to a charm school in Dallas, Texas. You know, they have them for businessmen where you can go and learn how to talk and walk you know, and, and dress and all these kinds of things. Uh, but anyway, he balanced that out and popped along in fine shape.
Papillon, a fine shape. There was another place in there where he got stuck. And uh, the discussion came around to who are you training? Who are you preparing to follow in your footsteps? In other words, are you mentoring? And he said he really didn't want to do that. And I said, well, that's going to be the next quantum leap. And um, what he decided to do was write a book and do a cassette series. And sure enough, he made the quantum leap. And we're not going to discuss his last figures because uh, they might be more or less now, but they were substantial. I know he was driving a uh, Corniche convertible. That's a Rolls Royce. And uh, he had a beautiful, beautiful home in one of the nicest areas in Dallas, Texas, which has money. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was making it fine. And it was not because he was hungry and greedy and accumulating. It was because of what? The contributions he was making to other people's lives. A lot of people got wealthy because of Jody. And therefore, somehow the law says, here's some for you too. Just works that way. Works that way. Uh, this is the way it works. Now, <clears throat> PEAK, of course, if you, if you know me, you know I'm up to something here. So uh, PEAK is an acronym. P-E-A-K. And what that means, a peak experience, is where you predetermine what it is you're about to do. You predetermine what it is you're about to do. I don't mean just this year or this month. What it is you're about to do. The next 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, you predetermine what you're about to do. You evaluate the effect that's going to have on your purpose and on your mission, on your plan and your projects. As you predetermine and you evaluate. As I say, there's no surprises. You know that if you do certain things, certain things are going to occur perfectly. Predetermine, evaluate, act on it. Do it right now. They say that if we could reduce the time between an idea and the action, everybody would be richer. You know what I mean? If you just kind of do it. And if you can't do it right now, Determine when you're going to start, when you're going to devote 10 or 15 minutes to it. Follow? Do it now or, or decide and, and commit to a time when you're going to devote 10 or 15 minutes to the project. So do it now or know when you're going to start. Act. Knowing that when you come out of the experience, it was the proper thing to have done. You know what that would feel like. You know what I mean? Yeah, you'd know what that would feel like. Predetermine, evaluate, act, knowing and having knowledge that it was the right thing to have done. If that's a peak experience, how many can you have in a lifetime? I mean, just infinite numbers of them. How many could you have in a year? Lots and lots and lots. How many could you have in a, a month or in a week or for that matter, even in a day? You see, if you don't do this, we naturally live our life by rote. See, we think about 50,000 thoughts a day, and if we're not careful, they're going to be the same thoughts we had yesterday. And the only way they won't be is if you plot, and you have establish a purpose and a plan, and then you begin to have peak experiences. It's kind of like the difference between um, reading your book of life or writing it. See, typically, if we, uh, if we kind of move along and do what we do naturally and what have you, we'll occasionally stop and look back and see how we've been doing. And as often as not, we're disappointed. Doggone it. I expected so much more. Uh, and then we say, okay. And then they start off again, and we'll stop and check, and once again. See, that's retrospective living. You're reading the books. Too late now. It's already done. But if you write the book, now if you come back here and say, this is what I'm going to do that contributes to what I'm about, and you do it, well, that's pretty healthy. So you're writing the book. Journalizing is a powerful thing. If you keep a journal, people find that their lives are somehow influenced by that. Because if you know you're going to write a journal entry tonight, do you think that would influence your behavior today? Some. But you know it's possible to write the journal entry in the morning. Say, this is what I'm going to do. This is my peak experience for the day. And predetermine those things that are well within the range of your abilities and develop skills, you know, or at least your capacities, and proceed. Practicing, and this is the way that'll work. Predetermine, evaluate, act, knowing it was the right thing to have done. You stack those together. I'll tell you, what, and I'll tell you the shorter the peaks, the better, by the way. 
Um, I have a young friend in Texas who got a master's degree in two years. Had to take 35 semester hours per semester to do that. It's quite a load. And, you know, and oh, by the way, he held down a full-time job while he was doing that. And uh, one day a friend of mine asked him, how do you do that, Rex? How do you do that? And he said, well, it was 10 minutes at a time. 10 minutes at a time. And having visited us with a few minutes, you know, he said, and I've just used up my 10 minutes here. I hope you'll excuse me. And he was on to his next peak experience. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just amazing. And by the way, he's been a millionaire a couple times already. Major contributor forces as a community, to his church and his family. Yeah, because this is the way he functions. This is the way he functions. Uh, what we're really saying when you do all this kind of stuff, that if you treated life like a puzzle, it wouldn't be one. Wouldn't be one. We go back for a moment and say, how come my daddy always got his puzzle together before I did? Now, if you just tuned in this evening, you don't have the prerequisite to understand. But we talked about how he was willing to be clumsy and inept and inadequate in his processes. If you remember what he did, okay? And as a result, he always won. He always got his puzzle together before I did. Uh, I could go on forever, but this evening we'll say thank you.